Okay, I want to call the meeting back to order. And to recap, we had uh, just gone through uh, some presentations from the Auditor General and staff. And I will uh, now take uh, requests for questions from members of the committee. Councillor Fillion. Yes, questions of staff. Um, so um, how soon can some of the major fixes be done? Uh, through the chair, so we are already implementing a number of changes that are leading to improvements. Um, in terms of the choice-based uh, letting system, we anticipate that that will be ready for implementation in 2020. And in, um, would I be correct that the first thing you have to do is fix your list? Uh, yes, we, we are aware data integrity is an issue and you want to make sure that you, the new system is starting in a good position. So um, how and when would you be fixing the list? Uh, it's currently underway. In the last few months, our staff have already made about 30,000 uh, phone calls, reaching out to clients, verifying their continued interest, and we will continue to do that. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Um, I'm intrigued by the idea, I think this goes to the Auditor General uh, based on uh, some of the work in here. I, I was intrigued by the idea of the notion of using vacant units and units that are vacant uh, for other purposes, for instance, in a building that's being emptied out because it's going to be constructed. But we know, uh, you know the, because of the slowness of the process that was talked about in the report, it can take a really long time to empty out a building because the tenants in there need to be relocated. And that thought was, you know, can we use them for other purposes, for instance, to shelter people? And um, I wondered what we knew about the law, uh, about rules around that. Um, I know there, there, is some, there is some discussion about how the mechanisms can work, but are we okay in terms of the Landlord Tenant Act? Um, and and you know, what, what has your, uh, your findings into that revealed? Uh, through the chair, that's definitely one of the things that I, we'll I think, have uh, to consider. I, I think I was going to ask the AG, okay, and then sorry. what we'll do is I'll, I'll I will allow uh, some some follow up on that. Yep. So, um, you know, these matters uh, can be complex, but um, at first at first look, it appears that emergency shelters. Um, don't come under like the landlord tenant. There's no uh, there's no agreement uh, where you have uh, that you have with a person. It seems to be a carved out exclusion. And so um, thinking outside the box, there may be an opportunity to have a unit designated. But uh, as a as a shelter unit, if you have a family in a different situation that you want to move in there temporarily while you're waiting for the building to be demolished, knowing that there are still other tenants in that building in other units, and those tenants would be under TCHC, but there might be the opportunity to have some of them, some other units that have, um, are designated for demolition to have a, a family in there. So there's, there's some things to work out, but under the law, you're gonna to have to get a formal legal opinion, but it looks like there's a potential carve out under the residential. Okay. Case. Uh, did staff have a, a further comment on that without going too far into it? I mean, it's part of the findings to look into it. No, absolutely, I, I would agree with, uh, with the auditor. We're, we're going to do some more um, due diligence on that uh, possibility. We're, we're also aware that through a report to planning and housing, um, the revitalization process is, is uh, being recommended to be delegated to create TO. So what we're looking for there is to maximize our asset and reduce the amount of time that uh, units are taken out of circulation for re revitalization. Um, next question I think is for staff, uh, and it could be um, either yourself or TCHC, I, I'm not sure. There's this, uh, this idea raised in here that, boy, there's an awful lot of withdrawals of an offer. And I'm thinking as I'm reading that, you know, a withdrawal is a really important thing to a tenant, or, or turning down an offer is a really important thing because there's you get three chances and then you're put by legislation, I think, 
either off the list or essentially to the bottom of the list. And the auditor raised some observations around rules on that, but could you tell us just a little bit, you know, what is your experience as staff? Why is it that there is so many withdrawals of an offer uh, versus it being deemed a refusal? Uh, through the chair, um, when you think about withdrawals, there's three kind of there's three situations we encounter frequently. The first, as the auditor has noted, is where we can't contact them. Uh, the second is where uh, their situation has changed. Many of the people applicants on the list have been on the list for a lengthy time, and so their situation has changed. And by the time we do reach them, we uncover some of those situational changes that uh, give rise to withdrawing the offer as well. We update their their preferences or whatever their situation is on the list, but they don't qualify for an offer anymore. Uh, those are kind of the, the the two that we encounter most frequently. Uh, the third, I would say, is where they identify um, restrictions. There might be accommodations that are required. Uh, they can't live above a certain floor. They need to live in a building with an elevator. And when we look at the unit that's offering, if it doesn't comport with those restrictions, we have to uh, withdraw the offer uh, as well. Where's the delegation to deem an offer a withdrawal versus a refusal? And, and what I'm really getting at the heart is, is I realize when you're down to your last thread, your last chance, um, you know, there may be some pleadings for grace on some of these circumstances. And, you know, so that somebody isn't booted off the list, it, it, it is found to be a, a withdrawal uh, for whatever criteria gets attached to that. Are you, are you comfortable that, you know, that's not really a prevalent issue? Um, you know, the, the bulk of the withdrawals are, as you said, as a result of not having current data or, or not being able to find the person. The, the decision is owned at the housing administrator level. Uh, those administrators are prescribed to go through training at a high frequency, so uh, we're generally comfortable that they are equipped to make that decision. The auditor in her report um, usefully suggests that the criteria for withdrawal would be more clearly defined, so we will work with SSHA to more clearly define and update the training so that they're fully equipped to make those decisions. Thank you. Um, are there other members of the committee and, and uh, guests uh, guests uh, that um, wish to ask questions. Councillor Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wondered on the 1,400 empty units, and Ms. Chan said that that was a conservative number, that you were very conservative in selecting just 1,400. Uh, is there a possibility to get kind of more detail on those, how many are being held for whatever reason, how many? Um, or do you have that somewhere clearly laid out? Uh, yes, we, we do have that uh, information. I believe it's handy. We took the numbers at the end of December, and at that time, SS, um, TCHC was holding about uh, 533 units for medical reasons. Uh, so we were basing it basically on about 800 or 900 units as the base, and then they released a few more, more back, so we came up with 1020 for TCHC, but across the entire spectrum for all housing providers, it would have been a total of about 1,400. Since then, TCHC has released um, uh, uh, in total 400, including the 170, so there's another 300 they've released. So on top of my 1020, there would have been about another 300 released of medical units, so that would go to uh, about um, 1,300, and then add in the units for other purposes, that would bring it higher. So the base for TCHC is no longer 1020 or 1160, it's much higher. And then across the spectrum, we have another two or 300 units for other housing providers that have vacancy. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's always a, a bit of a moving target, it's a little bit dynamic, but um, we took out any units that were having capital repair, that were being held for transfer, that were, um, you know, contract, you know, we took out as many as we could, this is the the solid base is around uh, 1160, and then it would increase from there. And Ina, do you have any comment on that? Is, is that a, a valid reflection of what you've seen? That's correct. So at December 31st, we reported for TCHC 1020. Uh, the uh, president and CEO in his uh, report to the board yesterday actually just uh, said that their, their numbers have come up, and that's the return of the medical and safety units uh, 
to the population for circulation, and then we also looked um, across the system. So this, the 1,400 is not just TCHE, but across the system. Right, so, so the, the number would go up by about another 300 that were released back into the system, so we're about 1,600 or so six total. Is that, sorry. <laughs> so your capital repair, is that for minor or major capital being held back? What uh, was the? We have the breakdown. Oh, go ahead, Ina. So uh, through the chair, uh, the ones that are removed are the ones that, uh, so we're basing our information on the information that was provided by TCHC, and it is capital, uh, capital repairs uninhabitable or needing significant repairs. We did not include that in our vacant and rentable numbers. And ones that have somebody move out and getting fixed up for someone else to move back in. Is that in that 1,400 or not? These are vacant and rentable, so. so um, there is a number there that would be interesting to know what that is, that. What that timeline yeah. is? Yes, is that, yeah? that would be good. Um, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Chair, if you could just. The other one is the wait list for reporting now on the centralized waiting list, oh, sorry. How is that reported out now, the centralized waiting list? How is that reported to committee or council? And. Uh, I Does that <clears throat> for staff could staff that might be a question for management but what we do what we did see is that there were numbers that were reported on the waiting list in the 2019 budget which is what is in our report the 1,000 yes. 100 6, 650, right. and on the website as well uh, there is a quarterly update on the city's website on this but it's not reported to committee then at any point as a part of an annual report uh, I didn't question. see but over to staff yeah, we um, report quarterly through the open data access on the City of Toronto's website. Um, that's where we report out on the uh, applica application activity. But you don't report to committee is what I'm trying that's to correct. get at, ever, about the wait list? Not on a regular basis, only when we would have a report going forward. So that's something that we could ask for, to have a quarterly report to committee to look at that. Somebody might make that. Um, Earlier, there was, uh, we heard great news that instead of six offers in order to get it rented, we're down to 3.2, but that seems to have happened between the end of December and now. Is that what you're telling us? The Auditor yes. General says six, you've now said 3.2, we're down to 3.2 to get somebody in offers. Yes, through the chair, um, we've been doing a concerted effort to provide training uh, to our staff to ensure that they're um, making the best use of their time in that regard, and we've uh, had those kinds of results. So you're telling me that that could have been the way that was all along if it had been managed properly? Uh, through the chair, there was a, we have taken the time to do some uh, cleanup of the wait list, uh, a concerted outreach to, to clients. Um, and that's been our focus in the last few months. Um, I think, it would, I'm just gonna ask the auditor, is there some way to have a bit of a supplemental to council that would indicate what's happened on the cleanup of the wait list and how that's been reduced from six offers to 3.2, or is that asking too much? So if I'm, I'm gonna rephrase your question, yep. just to make sure I'm understanding it. What you're asking is if we can go back and verify the 3.2 number as compared to the six. Yes. Uh, I'm gonna to turn to my, my, my staff. I do know that there is a little bit of, um, the challenge sometimes is that we can only use the information that's in the system. So if somebody records something that was, a call was made or a call wasn't made, the, like there's an maybe, integrity issue there. Yeah. But how long would it, could we in fact go back, um, uh, Assistant Auditor General uh, Ina, could we go back? Through the chair, uh, we could go back as long as we go. We only have data for a point in time. We'd have to go back into the system and see what the system says is recorded as offers and compare that to what's housed. Uh, the, one of the challenges for us is that uh, the data is only as good as what people are recording in the system. So if housing providers are recording all the offers and calls they are making or not, it's only as good as what's recorded in the system. It sounds and it would like take a at least there can be an update if that is the case to review what staff have undertaken and to validate the issue that they're saying they're at 3.2 and they've made strides. If, if we were going to do that, how long would it take to get the data down? I think we can get it down and have a look within the next two weeks. Is that too soon or would it be longer than that? Two weeks? 
We'll, just, we'll see what we can do before council. Um, yeah, I'm asking that yeah. question. Yeah, we, we'll see what we can do before council. We think we can do it, but we'll see. I mean, we'll have to, it's going to be a challenge, but we'll see if we can do it before council, okay? And if not, then Fair we'll enough. come back later. We'll do that. Uh, uh, Councilor Fisher, before we'll go too far, I just want to check with those other committee members that wanted to have a turn. Uh, I just and then what we. Question, then I'm done. I had four. Anyone else besides Councilor Nunziata? Uh, we, if it's okay, let's go through a rotation and we'll, we'll go for a second round. I mean, no there problem. may be more. There may be more coming out of this, and yep. I want to make sure you've got time to answer everything. You don't feel rushed. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Nunziata, and then Councilor Ford. Yes. Um, so. I can't find the percentage. I was trying to look for the present on um, offers that have been made, <coughs> Kenneth, and they're refusing um, the um, the offer. Mm -hmm. Like for what reason? Is it because of the location, or is it because of the building? Like if because when they when they apply, they give um, don't they give two or three different. Uh, uh, locations that they would like to um, transfer to or get housing for and then if they're offered do they give a reason why they're refusing it is it because of the building the location or the problems that, uh, that we have in the buildings but I know I know my team has that breakdown sometimes it's building preferences sometimes we don't even have a building listed as a preference it could be a floor preference um, I, I'm going to you have you do have the list in front of you yes so uh, through the chair, the top reasons that uh, based on the comments that were recorded in the system, and again, it, there must be a comment to be recorded in the system. If there's no comment, we can't comment on it. Uh, the top reason was an issue with the area. There was 30% of the refusals was an issue with the area. Uh, the second one, the comment was no response. The third, third highest category was the unit was too small, then not interested, and then an issue with the building. So those are the top five reasons that were recorded in the system as a refusal. So, so not interested. So, so my question then is, so when someone refuses for those reasons, they're, they're taken off the list, correct? No, um, they so have what happens, times. Uh, what, what happens to, to that? It takes list. three uh, refusals before somebody is removed from the list. So they will be cycled into the next offer process. Okay, so once they refuse three times, then they're taken off the list completely. Yes. Correct. Now, who is, um, uh, who, who is given priority? Um, is it tenants that want to move to a bigger unit or a smaller unit and transfers within their building, um, uh, or like people that are actually on the waiting list, they need housing and uh, they, they can't find housing. I think uh, I'm, I, I'm going to ask you to jump in here also, but really um, TCHC has a number of rules they had to go through. One of, it, one of the rules would relate to offering it to tenants in their building, some overhoused. Uh, people trying to move them to smaller units. And that's where I think things got bogged down a little bit because they were cycling through that and offers weren't getting actually made to, in all cases, to the wait list. So the bachelor for the seniors would be an example. So it's a question of the system not operating effectively uh, despite effort. So shouldn't priority be given to, um, to, to people that don't have housing and put them in, in first rather than someone that wants to upgrade or downgrade or I mean because they have housing like it isn't shouldn't that be the priority that people that are out there that have no housing at all and they need housing so be, mr. chair that's put on top of that list that's it mr. chair that's exactly what we recommend yeah. the city council take away and reestablish those uh, priorities because that would help all the system overall yeah um, well, one of the slides, uh, make better use of housing, you got some of the units are used for other purposes, for example, staff, recreation, community programs. So they're used, are, are these, these would be buildings that don't have space for recreation for the tenants and so they're using the units and uh, staff because there are some buildings that don't have that space for any recreation programs or any, you know, and so. Um, yes. Is that the case with this? So what we're yeah, what we're suggesting is 
there are some contractor storage, there are some recreation programs, and they are using some units, and we feel that the purpose is a, probably a supportable purpose. It's not that the purpose is wrong. What we're hoping is that the uh, take it away and see if there's another alternative, maybe having one of those, I mean, when I was in school, you'd have one of those, we were housed in a, in a trailer, like having the trailer used as a classroom. So looking for an alternative space to allow the unit to now be used by a family, still supporting the purpose, but finding a way to make a win-win. So we're suggesting that that be taken away and be delved into deeper um, offline. And there's also opportunities for partnership. 100%. With agencies in the area that will, will, will provide those recreation programs or uh, needs the, for the building and the, uh, you know, for the tenants in the building, and that we partner with them. 100%. I mean, I'm looking at the um, new respite care, the big blue trailers, and you're putting people in, in the trailer as their house and then leveraging the unit as a contractor storage. And we're saying, let's try to rebalance that support support uh, families where you can in, with housing, stable housing, and then find a, support the group by finding another accommodation as you suggested. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you, thank Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you um, to, to our staff or to the Auditor General, um, so the first thing that comes to mind, and I can't uh, pull up the report, but there was the Ombudsman's report done on trial community housing and the pri priority transfer, uh, and I don't know if that covered the wait list as well for, uh, for new people coming in uh, to TCHC uh, for housing. Um, how does the, your report, uh, Madam Attorney General, uh, coincide with the Ombudsman's report? Um, have, you, have you looked at that report? And yes, yes I have, and, uh, and I'm supportive of the report. Mm -hmm. um, it dovetails in uh, a couple of ways. Um, the, the, she did identify, identify medical um, items. Uh, people have medical concerns and safety concerns within the building. We took those units out. So if a, if a unit was set aside for a medical reason, we didn't count that at all in the report. Um, we also suggested looking at other items to prioritize. And it might be that medical may be one of those items as city council moves forward. So we, we looked at the two, two sides of the coin. Um, so that's, that's what I can say. In the wait list, I don't know if her report covers that. I can't remember, but mm -hmm. that's another area. If somebody has a medical issue that requires stable housing, right. and it might be the medical officer who can speak to that. Okay. Um, so, so with that being said, uh, there's no doubt that City Council and the Toronto Community Housing Board, I, I sit on that, um, have, have had this as a concern for a long time. And even I remember one of the first conversations of myself joining the board was the frustration around empty units. Um, so City Council is given direction. Uh, I think uh, the board has uh, weighed in on the issue a number of times. Um, and I'm sure as you've mentioned in your presentation, you've seen that. Where is the gap here? Why, why aren't we seeing this move forward? I think at one moment you said in your uh, presentation um, around waiting on a new system and whatnot, but you did it on, uh, on an Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that and explain what you think the gaps are? Um, sure, through you, Chair. I think the front end of getting people into housing is split. It's uh, the front end of checking whether somebody's a Canadian citizen on the list is, is by SSHJ. Eligibility is checked by the housing provider as far as income goes. It's split. So, and some of the issues where TCHC was offering units um, because they were following their internal list, it wasn't getting over to the centralized wait list. My view is you need to harmonize both of those pieces, first of all, and then hold the person or the group accountable um, to make sure the units get filled, to get through these uh, bureaucratic barriers and to move forward with getting people housed. There's no doubt it's a complicated matter and I don't wanna simplify it, but, but at the same time, 
I don't think people can wait. They do need housing, so it's important that you move forward. So cer certainly, so first of all, make sure you ha bring it together and have the front end done by the city. Make the uh, city manager give them the power and the control and the, um, and the, the support he needs, and then focus on outcomes, tracking outcomes of getting people into units. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, with the consent of the committee, I, I believe there's a desire for an additional round. Um, Councillor Fletcher, I, you know I, you had some other questions. I said I had one, but now I have two. No problem. After all those great questions by the committee. It was, it was the smart, it was the smart <laughs> strategy, right? Thank you. <laughs> um, this one really is to SSHA staff um, related to the bachelor units that the Auditor General has found are there and don't appear to be um, offered out other than internally. And our new shelter model, such as the one at the Hope Shelter, has a housing division there to get people out of the shelter. It's a new model to make sure people are transferred out. Can you tell me if that's being used now to get those folks out and into the bachelors? And um, unless, it, how has that been working? It doesn't sound to me like it's been working well enough yet. Uh, through the chair, so yes, the housing workers are in place uh, at that uh, at the New Hope Shelter. Um, the offers are, need to be made through the legislative framework, uh, so people need to be on the housing wait list. They need to have identified those buildings as one of their preferences, um, and they need to be offered in terms of their eligibility, either by their wait list date or by their priority placement. I think what we've learned through this report is there's certainly ways that we can tighten up that process um, and work much more closely with TCHC on the stock of units that they're finding it difficult to rent and how can we target uh, some of our priority populations to those available units when they're not in a position to rent them. Do you know how many uh, people that would have been at the Hope Shelter were offered any of those? Um, offhand, I don't know that, Councillor, but I'm happy to look into that number and provide it to your office. I think I'll just ask the auditor to look. Sorry, who's not? Mr. Chair. Um, just on that kind of model where you found that breakdown where there's not, there's bachelors mm -hmm. and people homeless, and we also have uh, people working in our shelters trying to hook up those who are homeless into apartments, including bachelors, would you be able to just look at that one location and see if that's worked well or we need to tweak that a little bit? So the question is whether we can look at Hope Shelter to see how many offers has been correct. successful in relation to moving people into stable that's housing. Uh, we can do that. Uh, my staff, my team said that they can go and verify that. Thank you. And then there was another one where I just heard I think it was either you or one of your staff or Councillor Ford, uh, just talk about having to, in order to make sure that we get right in and get at this, whether or not we just leave it to there our process or whether or not a kind of SWAT team would be set up to go in and be very aggressive on all fronts in order to make these fixes. I don't know what you'd think of that. I really leave it to management to decide how they can best tackle this problem if they are held to outcomes. But I can say, from my, my view of where I'm at, where, what I've seen, what got us here might not get us to where we need to be. So there may be change that has to happen to make it happen. Okay, thank you. I'll probably move that here or at council. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Are there any other members wishing to ask additional questions? Just to speak. Councillor Matlow, I've got you first. Uh, sorry, I should, I should ask Councillor Fletcher. No, I think Councillor are, are you going to speak, Councillor? You, you have a question? Okay, hang on here. Councillor Fil Fillion wants sorry, to ask um, an additional just question. If we were looking for um, regular updates on the status of this, um, at how soon would you be able to show an appreciable improvement? Kevin, do you want to? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I thought that was too. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. 
Sorry, Councillor, can I, I just want to make sure I understand your question. Oh, if you we just... were looking for updates on, um, you know, such measurement factors as number of people on the waiting list, number of vacant rentable I, I, units. I think, that, I think um, that is, yeah. You know, number of offers right. it takes to fill a unit, the length of time it takes to fill a unit, all those kind of quantifiable things. Um, how soon, there's no point in going back and measuring it immediately, so what would be a point in time where you would expect to see a significant improvement? I, I'm going to let SHA speak to it first, and then I will speak to it subsequently, because it's a two-pronged question. That's right. Um, so uh, eligibility is, is certainly with us in, in our management of the, of the wait list. Um, as I said, we've taken some actions in the last few months and have seen some considerable improvement, and we will continue down that, down that road. Um, also, as we get closer to developing the business rules for choice-based letting, we're, we're discovering new ways to improve our, our manual processes. Um, so I think, you know, over time, between now and when we implement that, we will see continual improvement. So I, I'm, I'm getting too complicated an answer. I'm looking for an actual date at which to ask you to report back with quantifiables. So I think we're going to be asked to report back quarterly on our, on our status. Uh, for the wait list and we can include the incremental improvements in those quarterly updates if that would satisfy your question. Um, sure, and you're reporting back quarterly where? Um, I think we're just trying to figure that out. Which committee? I think it's uh, ECDC. ECD. Oh, we're, we're still negotiating that piece, trying to get some direction on which is the appropriate committee. Yes, yeah, so, but it, that so whatever portion of that deals with the quantifiables could come here as yes. well. Okay. Oh, You're to, looking to at audit committee. Yes. Uh, I don't know if it would. I'm. Uh, I'll maybe look to the chair or the clerk for direction on whether or not that would be appropriate, or whether or not it would go to one of the committees. Um, well, I wouldn't suggest that it only come here. I'm just. I'm, I don't know how else we're able to monitor the extent to which the recommendations are being implemented or um, having any effect. Uh, through the chair, I, I believe the auditor does report on the status of outstanding recommendations to this committee. I'm, I wonder whether or not the, that would be included in, in that report. Well, it, it could be. Again, I'm, I'm just looking for a, um, a date by which you expect to see a very significant improvement. Uh, I, I'm finding it hard to give you a, an exact answer at the moment. Um, what I will say is we will we'll start reporting on a quarterly basis and we will include those performance measures in that report and we'll work very closely with the auditor um, on an update to these outstanding audit uh, recommendations. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other questions before we close this? Okay. Um, Councillor Fletcher, um, you have first in the sequence to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your indulgence on the number of questions. This is uh, more than a little bit interesting to me and I think also to uh, my colleague, Councillor Ford. We're both on Toronto Community Housing Board, grappling with a number of different things there, including vacancies and making sure that we don't have many vacancies. So. Getting to the bottom of the empty units and how quickly they're turned around is something we are focused on. The Auditor General is very helpful having her do that. I think Councillor Matlow has a motion on reporting. I was a little surprised just to hear that the only time the wait list has ever been reported on is at the budget where we're reporting on the waiting list rather than to committee and in a regular day of showing a regular way of how that is either incrementally growing or not growing. Every once in a while you'd hear it's gone from 70,000 to 100,000. I think what Mr. Richardson said is that it might not actually, there's a lot of people on the waiting list and our systems might not be good enough to be accurate as to who's really on the waiting list. And when Chris Kringle is still waiting for a home, 
perhaps not everybody on there is real, or perhaps people have moved, or perhaps they've got a different phone number. There's so many ways um, moving from landlines to other lines. So I would really look forward to knowing what that actual number really is, if we can get to the bottom of that. That would lead me to this idea of more of a SWAT team rather than just leaving it up to regular process that a very targeted team that the DCM would probably undertake to have very clear <coughs> deliverables and information that would be coming back because I don't think it can be sit staff that are working on that every day. I think they need some assistance in that. I am happy that the Auditor General agreed to kind of use a, the Hope Shelter as a bit of a, um, I don't want to say a pilot, but looking at how well that's worked because it's been open for that period. There's been housing people there. They're paid to sit there and help people find accommodation. I'd be interested how that interfaced with the waiting list. Those, that's real life. How has that worked in real life so far? Does anything else need to be corrected? And as well, to work with the staff to ensure that their uh, number and that their turnaround of three offers, if that's the case since December, I think that's great news since the Auditor General's report. But given that she is the auditor and checking numbers is her business for us, I think it's just helpful to have that validated. So she's agreed to do those two things without a motion, and I'll see about council what that looks like as far as having more of a, a focused approach by a small team of people to just drive this even a little bit harder. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the auditor for her work here, being on TCHC and having this report, and having been on community development and recreation for so long and having developed the new shelter model with Councillor Bailao. This is all one big piece that all fits together. And the last report that you brought to us about lack of new affordable housing, I thought that was very important. This is important and I know you'll have more reports in order to make the city, the shareholders of housing and our ability to house people well as a great landlord be more effective every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Next on the list, I have Councillor Matlow. I have uh, two motions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One is uh, that uh, City Council request the uh, General Manager Shelter Support and Housing Administration through the implementation of the new choice-based model for access to social housing to expand access to information available through the City's open data portal and open to the and report to the Auditor com uh, Audit Committee by Q4 of 2020. On the status of implementation, the general manager be requested to engage Toronto's civic tech community on this project. The other motion I have is that City Council request that the general manager shelter support and housing administration to report quarterly to the Economic and Community Development Committee on the centralized waiting list for social housing. The first one, um, as you heard from Mark Richardson, uh, is a uh, response to the need for absolute transparency, which also can contribute to accountability with as much data as we can share publicly. Uh, not only does that help uh, those in the civic tech community and others uh, to be able to provide information to us when they see something working well, something not working well enough, and information to bring to our attention that is necessary to inform us to make better decisions. The other thing I love about uh, open data is that just the more information that's out there, it means that we are always feeling the fire to our feet. The very fact that we know that, that there is such a public uh, lever of accountability means that we, along with management, are just more aware every single day uh, that we need to use information wisely and to be able to account for the decisions we make. Uh, the other one is, and this is inspired by Councillor Fletcher's questions, uh, to um, have a quarterly report. This is sort of the bookend to that level of accountability on the public side, but also that there be a quarterly check-in on uh, not only the promises made, but also how we are keeping those waiting lists and are, are we managing them effectively, efficiently, ethically, uh, and in a way that really responds to um, just obvious prioritization of those needs out there that are immense, 
um, and uh, and at this point overwhelming uh, based on the resources that we have. Every councillor, I would imagine, and I'm one of them, um, would say that's, that some of the most disturbing and difficult conversations we ever have is when we hear from um, a resident who says, I'm in need of housing. And uh, they, each one will tell a story that is worse than the last one we heard. And just as a human being, you listen to this and you want to do anything possible to help them. You want to save them. You want to, do, you want to be able to, you wish that you could make a call and figure it out. Um, and in many, if not most cases, you feel helpless because uh, there is a waiting list uh, of, you know, far north of 100,000 people of eight to nine years. Uh, there aren't enough units available and you know that there probably won't be one available anytime soon for this individual or their family. And you feel frustrated and you feel angry. Uh, we've also heard stories over the years, I have, and I wonder if some of you have too, where you'll hear from a resident in a senior's TCH building and they'll say, there's a couple of empty units. There's a couple of vacant units on my floor. Like, what's going on with them? And then you'll get TCH on the phone. They'll, they'll give you all sorts of reasons why they're in transition or why they're being held for some reason. Uh, uh, and intuitively, it just doesn't make sense to you. But you, you wonder, OK, they, they might know what they're talking about. And may, maybe there is a good reason. And you press and you push. But somehow, inside of you, you're thinking, like, this doesn't make sense. There, there, there's such a long waiting list. Why, why would these be? empty for a month, if never mind six months or more. So none of that's ever made, ever made sense to me. Um, but now that we hear stories about how there are, you know, thousands of people, for example, in our homeless shelters, three, I believe 3,000 people in our homeless shelters who aren't deemed to be a priority and, uh, and, and, and considered homeless, uh, again, just doesn't make sense to me. Um, when you hear about units being used for storage for contractors. That doesn't make any sense to me. When we're spending even more money to rent motel rooms, when you've got a unit sitting around that just hasn't, you know, got a paint job, that just, that just, that just seems stupid. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. And we have no room for failure. There is no room for failure when you're dealing with people's basic ability to have a home that they can afford and they can live in. Uh, th there is no room for failure. When I hear about this, you know, nonsense stuff about Chris King Kringles and, uh, you know, made-up names and people who have already passed on the waiting list with no, no effective check-in, check no, no accountability on that, uh, it angers me. It really does. Um, I don't understand how this wasn't caught sooner, and I don't understand why this wasn't dealt with long ago. Uh, and I believe that there needs to be some accountability for that. There needs to be some answers for that. Um, because I don't, it's one thing to sit down with a resident, um, especially like there are seniors who I deal with every day, who um, given the, um, given typically their ages and, and the, the number of years that it would take to get a unit. I'm sitting with them and I know, I know that they're probably not going to be able to live long enough to ever get a home. Um, there is no room for failure. And I, I appreciate that, I mean, Marion Bedard, for example, I know not only is a great professional, but is a wonderful human being who feels the same way as I do. And I know your whole team feels the same way. And I, uh, I say this all to hopefully encourage you to be the leaders that I know you are and to act upon the advice that you've received to see every one of these recommendations through to fruition and, and, and go any steps further you can. Um, but I, you know, I, I think I share the, the I know my frustration is shared by many throughout our communities when uh, TCH, for example, the people on the ground are amazing. But why is a corporation that is uh, responsible for some of the most vulnerable people in our city uh, dealing with another crisis or scandal like virtually every year. Like of all, of, all, of all corporations in the entire world, the one that's supposed to be there to be the most sensitive, the most responsible, 
the most uh, uh, approachable and the most effective for the most vulnerable is one of the most screwed up organizations year after year after year. Uh, that just like that can't we, that can't just continue to be the way it is. So I hope that um, staff will continue the work that I know that they've already begun. I want to give them credit uh, to move forward with uh, these recommendations and uh, get the job done for the people they serve. But uh, isn't it isn't it just devastating that we're having to have this conversation in the first place? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. I'm just going to check if there's other committee members that want to speak on this. I know, Councillor Fillion, um, I think you're going to get the last word because we're just finalizing a motion. Um, okay. I, uh, I will speak uh, briefly because I have a motion. Councillor Nunziata? on some of these recommendations because, as you know, unless we, <laughs> at the end of the year, when you give us an update on all the recommendations for all the various uh, agencies and then they come forward and half of them haven't been implemented, you know, that's what we don't want to see. We want to have an ongoing update on it. So hopefully we can get that update. Um, you know, it seems like um, this issue with Toronto housing, I mean, and the, the waiting list, it's, it's been years since we've been dealing with the same issue. I mean, when I was on the board a few years ago, it was the same issue, and it keeps getting, it, it, nothing changes. And now that when, when you see some of the, um, the recommendations and the stats and what was presented to us today, uh, you know, when units are being used for something else or then the waiting list and, um, and uh, the, the refusal and, and all that and the reason uh, the reason behind it like I'm, I'm you know like it's just shocking to hear that and I agree with you it's one of the one of the most difficult uh, reports so I do support the recommendation support Councillor Matlow's motion and, and Councillor Billy and your motion the problem that we have as well is. Um, you know, in some buildings, and I know that some tenants uh, are refusing um, housing in some of the buildings because of the state of the building and the location of the building, because that's an issue as well. Where there are buildings where there's a lot of crime and that people don't want to be, t uh, don't want housing in these buildings. And we have some buildings that have been taken over by some gangs and that, and they're taken over and they're taken over the units. And in the meantime, we have a waiting list of people wanting housing, and then we have all this going on, you know, in, internally, where people have actually taken, um, you know, taken over units where tenants have left or are elderly, and they're coming in and just taking the units over and uh, doing whatever they have to do um, in these units. And so that's an issue for me as well. So, but that's not what's before us. But you know we really, you know, we really have to look at some of these um, issues and some of the recommendations and some of the problems that we're having in our buildings. And um, you know, I'm thank you very much for bringing forward the recommendations. And uh, I know, Councillor Fletcher, you'll be m moving a motion at Council as well. But um, you know, I'll, I'll support whatever recommendation we have before us. And you know, we really need to get to. Um, uh, to the bottom and, and people that are waiting on the waiting list that don't have housing at all to me that's a priority um, other than people asking for transfers uh, for bigger units or smaller because you know when you have people living on the street you want to house uh, the homeless first and to me that's that's really a priority for me and that's what we should be focusing on Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll take a moment to speak, and I, I know Councillor Fillion's got a motion, so I know that's just being typed out. Um, I do have a motion. So we asked the General Manager to accelerate the implementation of recommendations um, that are related to the rules around households with greatest need and getting priority, uh, and those households with um, overhoused tenant situations. 
It's kind of generally written um, because I think it's buried in a few of the recommendations, but the ones that stand out to me are recommendation 14 and 18. Uh, and I take note that on recommendation 18, uh, 18 um, there was discussion about bringing back reports in 2020 or 2021. I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, this was um, a striking report and it was evident just as even when the Auditor General began to speak to us uh, about how powerful it is. It, you know, we, we talk about a lot of things at the committee about tree trimming and roadways and asphalt and, and uh, um, benefit plans, those type of things, but this is really about humans uh, and humans living in the city. Um, I spend a lot of time at council uh, fighting things that gum up the works and, and this is one of those reports that are going to ungum the works. And the benefit about that is you know, not just about financial savings but, you know, but getting people into housing faster. Um, there's a whole basket of things that are contained in the recommendations. Some of them are really technical in nature and they're about data and they're about processes. Uh, but there's a couple of things in here that are, you know, and sorry, those, those other ones really re re pertain to the staff, right? And, you know, how the system works. Some of them are really about really important policies. And what stood out to me amongst some of the recommendations were the discussion that council has to have about how we prioritize a bunch of people that have been waiting on the list for years and years and years and years, waiting patiently um, with maybe vulnerable people that are in a shelter uh, and, and whose situation might be a little different than those that are waiting on the list. And then we've got that other situation of people that are overhoused. And you know, generally the situation I think, if, if, if I've seen through experience, is you know, you've got a family and the family grows up and heads off into their way and you've got some extra bedrooms and we've got a whole bunch of families on the waiting list trying to secure a location like that and maybe one or two people are left, maybe they're senior, maybe they're not in those other units and they're struggling to work their way through the system that's gummed up trying to find another place to live to make the space. And so I think as a council, we have to have that conversation, but you know, I realize the staff have to go through a bunch of process to look at those policies, including public consultation. And so uh, there, there's been a commitment in the report to hit a date, and I would like to suggest to council that we earnestly ask that that conversation be accelerated. It's not uh, just the staff that have to resolve that, it is the public, and it is us as council. And so I don't want to wait too long for that report to come. Um, I don't want to rush their work, but I also want to just uh, lay claim that, you know, part of this is right on the shoulders of council to work through those policies. And so that's really the, the deeper intent of the motion. And that, and I'll say, you know, I really appreciate all of the work of the staff on this, and I really appreciate the work of the Auditor General and, and her team on this. Um, there is a lot in here. Uh, and it, I know that there was a lot of hard work done on this. Um, some of the, the most difficult cases that come to a counselor's office at times can be people trying to find their way through the housing system, um, working their way through a lot of circumstances. And I'm thinking of a couple of very active um, circumstances that we're working through right now in my office. And one of the themes about it, it just seems to be there's just so much paperwork and administration and the difficulty that people have to go through to navigate all, and, and, and we're experts here in government and counselor's offices to navigate through systems and imagine squaring this on the shoulder of somebody that's, uh, you know, that just needs to worry about their household and, and their life. So anything that makes life simpler and clearer, anything that makes things more transparent so people feel confident in the system, feel confident that you know, they are working their way through a list and there's others that really and truly are ahead of them and that's why it is taking so long, I think is a good thing. And um, if we can get some people into housing faster, I think that's a really, really good thing. So I hope you'll support that motion um, and with the deepest respect to staff because I know they need to work through this stuff but I think we should say as a council that you know, we're ready to have that conversation and please bring it to us as fast as you can. Thank you. Councillor Fillion. Um, thank you. I have a motion that the audit, audit committee recommend that City Council request to General Manager 
Shelter Support and Housing Administration to report annually to the Audit Committee with the following details on the centralized wait list for social housing, the number of people on the list, the number of vacant rentable units, the number of units filled, the number of refused offers, the number of withdrawn offers, any other relevant information. Um, so to go back to the beginning, just uh, want to thank the Auditor General and her staff for uh, um, excellent work as, as usual. Um, but I do also want to say that I, I'm, and I, I think others here would share the same view, that there's nobody in the city who would be more upset about people going unhoused than uh, Marianne Bedard and, and all of her staff. So, um, you know, and this is, it is, um, you know, it's a, it is a really difficult subject and sometimes uh, with the best of intentions it's difficult to find solutions to to pick an extreme case we have people in homeless shelters who desperately need housing and we have empty units but um, to get a hold of the person in the homeless shelter to track their whereabouts to put them in a unit where they have the supports they need um, in order not to it, to go badly both for them and the other people in the building. All of these things are extremely complicated. On the other hand, you know, we to find solutions to some of these things, you have to go to the simplicity of we have tens of thousands of people who need housing and we have empty units. So. Um, I think it's the it's not the complexity we need to measure; it's the simplicity we need to measure, and um, you know it's it's one of those subjects where I don't think we're ever going to see a report saying everything is working just perfectly because of the subject matter and the complexity of it and the complexity of the situations you run into, but I think everybody acknowledges and the staff certainly acknowledge that we can do much, much, much better. And, uh, and I think that is measurable and quantifiable. And um, I think the more, um, the more scrutiny on the measurable part of it and at the same time tell us, as the chair said, tell us what you need so we can help you get there. Um, I think that's what we need to do. So the purpose of this motion is just that we have a way of trying to quantify as much as you can with this subject matter, uh, how well we're doing in resolving the, the problems that have existed for a long time. Um, Councillor Matlow. Through you, Chair, uh, it's a question, uh, obviously, to uh, Councillor Philly and the mover. Um, so uh, I preface this question just to, to provide you just with a little bit of information why I'm, I'm going here. Um, when, I, when I started working on the motion uh, to ask for the quarterly report, I checked with the, uh, the clerk and, and other staff and, and to try to understand what path would we take. And you may remember earlier in this meeting, we had a conversation about the Auditor General's role and you know what, what it is and what it's not. So the Auditor General's role is to report to us and then we you know, make recommendations and we move motions out of that. But then the ongoing uh, 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 burden of you know, ensuring accountability with staff is up to us to then say, you've got to report to a standing committee. It's, you've, got to, you know, you've got to go to whatever the relevant standing committee is. It's not for the Auditor General to kind of keep checking up on staff in any context. So I also then checked which standing committee it would be and we did a lot of back and forth about that. Uh, I agree to, Councillor Fletcher and I were talking about intuitively it seemed like it should go to housing. What was explained to me is that housing is the sort of what we're about to build or might, what we're planning, and then the community development aspect of economic development and community development is about sort of what we have and then how do you build community through that. So would you, would you enter, so I say that uh, to ask you, rather than ask this to come to audit committee, which everyone, everyone that I've spoken with has said, uh, unequivocally, this isn't the right committee for the follow-up report to come to. It should go to the relevant standing committee. That um, perhaps 
If you want a little more detail in the quarterly report that is being requested in the motion that I moved earlier, that you add as a friendly amendment, because I don't think any of us are in disagreement about the ask, it's just where it goes, yeah. to parse out the, the, the details that you're asking for and just put it into that report request, the quarterly report request to the ED, EDCD committee, ECDC um, committee. Sure, AC, AC, and AC. I, I almost went that way and um, um, switched it to uh, annual uh, instead of uh, quarterly and uh, and here it just partly because this body can s sort of dive into numbers perhaps more readily than um, some of the other committees but you know I, I I'm, um, I'm certainly, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's like I'm not clear on how best we do our job and monitor a problem that's been brought here. Oh, that, that's um, an ongoing existential question. I, I, yeah, I agree. And, and um, um, versus, you know, not, you know, not wanting to usurp the role of another committee. So, um, if um, if the other members of the committee and I'm looking over to the chair think this is usurping the role of another committee, then I would change it. So um, so I so I ask you, uh, given that and given that, uh, I, I I I think it's quite possible this may not be approved the way that it's written, given where it's directed. Oh yeah, no, and I'm um, open to changing yeah. it. I just I'm wrestling with it myself, frankly. So okay. I'm interested in. Your point of view. I'm interested in what I appreciate the chair that. has to say. Yeah. So why don't we just amend it then? So so would you so uh, would you would you then purse it out, put it onto the other motion? No, I, I certainly okay. would be willing to if that's what most people think is uh, more appropriate. Yeah. Great. Councillor Ford, um, you wanted to ask some questions of the mover as well, or I think you said you want, would you like me to? The, uh, same question. <laughs> All right. I'll I'll. Uh, Try another variant to uh, follow you, the procedures here to three if that's, uh, make it make it go smoothly. Would you, uh, Councillor Fillion, in um, in contemplation of this, would you consider that an unintended outcome may be to bring the same subject matter before two committees at the same? No, time? no, it might. So I'm I'm yeah. totally open if the so I, I believe okay. in the collective wisdom of this committee. So if I have three people telling me, would, uh, would, would you be open to an amendment way? that would suggest that? Uh, you append Councillor Matlow's yeah. motion with the detail that you're seeking, and Councillor Matlow's motion is to go to the committee, but we say to the committee and council, and therefore it's brought before the whole body. Sure. And that gives us all a chance to get into the report, and if we wanted to get into the subject matter, we do it at a council rather yeah. than at this place. Would sure. that be a satisfactory amendment? Sure, absolutely. Okay. We yeah. work so well together. <laughs> okay, let's go. <laughs> Madam Speaker, <laughs> duly noted. Um, we're just going to check just to make sure we've got the, uh, the text ready. All right, so... Uh, can help me with these with the order. Um, 1A is going to be Councillor Matt F Matlow's uh, first motion on uh, the open data. All of those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Um, 1B is Councillor Matlow's motion as amended by Councillor Fillion. All those in favor? Any opposed? That is carried. Um, motion number two is uh, my motion on uh, accelerated uh, Reporting on that. All those in favor? Any opposed? And the last vote is on the item as amended. All of those in favor? Any opposed? And that is carried. I had an additional uh, housekeeping matter. Um, it was brought to my attention that a motion placed on item number.
Okay, we're going to go to the, uh, the final audit item. Um, there is a matter we will deal with at the end of it. So this is AU 3.15. Um, Councillor Fillion, you had indicated desire uh, for a presentation. This is the last item. We are, all, we are going to reopen an item, though. We're going to request a brief presentation. While we're, uh, while we're setting this up, um, AU 3.10, um, I would consider a motion to reopen the item. Uh, it was originally moved that we, the audit committee would have the auditor report uh, on um, matters relating to Toronto building. And I think in discussion, we've determined that the chief building official would be most appropriate to uh, report on that. So may I take a motion to reopen? All those in favor? Um, we're gonna, that item is being reconsidered with a new motion that says that the audit committee requests the chief building official and executive director of Toronto Building to provide an update to the October 25th, 2019 meeting of the audit committee on outstanding recommendations highlighted in this item that relate to Toronto Building, specifically those around building permits and building inspections. All those in favour of the new motion? Any opposed? And that is carried. So that item has been... Um, adjusted. Perfect. So we are now on our final item, AU 3.15, Engineering and Construction Services, Phase 2, Construction Contract Change Management Controls should be strengthened. Uh, we have a presentation. Thank you. And to my left, I have Richir Patel, and Richir is the person who leads a lot of the engineering projects within our portfolio. Um, to put this project, to put this presentation into context, this is, to me, a continuous improvement situation. So this is a situation where the, um, there's a lot going on. We look, looked at the change order process in the engineering process, so $2 billion in capital projects, and we looked at the change order process, which is about $200 million within the process. And, our, and the objectives were um, to look at, to make sure there is reasonable um, support for change orders, if it was justified, to make sure the policies and procedures were in place. And we looked at the period of 2013 to 2017. We looked at 10 completed projects. There's a lot in those projects. We looked at 90 change orders. Um, and uh, so we looked at um, uh, about how many million, nine, $9 million worth the uh, change orders. Um, and a change order is really when you need to have a change in scope or you need to have a change in cost or something arises unexpectedly. And a change order is a normal part of an engineering process. You can have change orders. What we're concerned about is that they are controlled, that they're supported, that they're signed off properly, those kinds of things. And what I can say is, well, these are some of the reasons. You can have an errors made, omissions. You can have contractor making claims. There could be a scope change. This is the, these are the reasons for the change orders. Now, what's really good about the engineering services, um, I have found historically in working with um, the chief engineer, he was the person who helped to design the change in the transportation portfolio when we had the paving contracts. And what I found is that there can be errors or things that happen, but the design of the guidelines was very good in this process. So the, what is required to be done is laid out well by engineering services. Where we have some challenges is more in the compliance area. Um, documentation was missing. There was some background to negotiation, price negotiations missing. Um, sometimes staff would identify potential errors or omissions, but we wouldn't see the follow through to see if there was any potential liability, um, that kind of thing, uh, and pursue a recovery where necessary. So here's the breakdown. We wanted to understand where there was a, a problem, wh where it was happening. We did find that there were some design errors and omissions, which can happen, um, but the, we found problems with sign-off, uh, proper sign-off and delegation of authority. Sometimes staff might 
use a couple of change orders and not have the proper sign off. Um, so, so there'll be some work completed without authorization. So this is the breakdown, the most in the top category. Um, and we felt it important moving forward that, um, that um, ECS make sure that they track why a change order is needed so it can help them to make improvements going forward. One of the areas we found was that um, they didn't include a robust evaluation where there was, uh, like there were some design errors and omissions and there's no follow-up to make sure that um, if a contractor was liable that it was followed through. So we thought, felt that they could do a better job in this area. Not to say that if there was an error that the contractor is automatically liable, but we felt there could be more done within the file. They didn't really track areas for change orders. Um, where change orders were occurring, we felt it relevant so that they could tighten up in those areas going forward. Um, and uh, we felt that the, um, they should track where the change order uh, is happening. Um, we felt that the cost of engineering, the construction portion was, um, I guess it was about 10%, or no, it was 90%? Change, yes? change, change order is 10%. Yeah, the change the change order was 10% of the uh, of the construction. Do you want to just add a comment there? Sorry. Yeah. So the, the change order cost um, is about 10% of the the contract value. And the actually engineering plans within their budget for that 10% uh, change order, but we felt that there could be more documentation around why why they were needed. The rates, uh, we found that consulting, the consulting part of the contracts can ri is rising a little bit. It's a little higher, I guess, in the most recent years. So we thought it was just important to keep that information. There's nothing wrong there. I, we just think it's important to keep the information. What we're trying to get in behind is why are some of the change orders happening, um, whether it's a possible opportunity to uh, recover from a contractor who's made an error. Let's do that. Do you want to walk through some of the examples? We have two examples. Yep. So um, we had uh, several examples, but the two that uh, we would like to talk about. Uh, first example is major roads contract. In this contract, we had about 15 change orders totaling to uh, half a million dollar. The contract uh, total contract value was 3.76 million. So that's a significant uh, percentage of change there. Uh, one of the issues we, we noted was sidewalk design error. There was elevation uh, wrongly drawn by the um, uh, the design staff and the sidewalk had to be removed and reinstalled, and this was, in our view, was a necessary change order, which costed $271,000. Second example is a basement flooding contract where we had uh, three change orders that were not approved by management. They were not put forward to management for approval and consideration. The work amounted to $658,000 uh, management, uh, senior management approval was not obtained in this case. And um, if this change orders are approved, they would cause the POF amount to be exceeded by half a million dollars there. Mm -hmm. So I'll just summarize. Um, there are four recommendations to improve. To, uh, one is to minimize the design errors. Two, to improve controls over the authorization and the change order of work. Three, to assess the um, the costs and pricing and for to have better oversight of contractors and consultants work. Now um, I can say that you know you're always wondering are they going to be implemented. I can say that my my experience with the chief engineer is that he designed and set up the, the, um, the rules well, the guidelines. There were instances where they weren't followed. In the files that we've seen action is being taken um, and I have every confidence that these will move forward. It's, it's not a situation where you're going to have to worry whether it's going to be changed. So uh, even though the numbers are big, um, but he can speak to these individual projects. Thank you. Are there questions of staff and the committee members? Thank you. Um, brought to my attention that there, there's additional slides. 
Yes, I've got to beg your indulgence, uh, given the thank fact you. it's Friday before the long week, and I'm going to make this brief. Uh, I want to thank, uh, first and foremost, uh, the Auditor General and, uh, and staff uh, for undertaking the, uh, the review. And again, just very, uh, very quickly. Just very quickly, it goes without saying that you know our mission is to build safe and sustainable infrastructure that enhances the quality of life for for the people of Toronto. I want to take you to the to the next slide, which in a nutshell captures you know the the division. So at the at the root of what uh, most of the division represents is the construction of municipal infrastructure, and we're a service provider to uh, transportation, to Toronto Water, solid waste, TTC. We also do some work for Toronto Hydro. We also are custodians of an awful lot of engineering information. Uh, for example, bridge condition assessments. The gardener, for example, is included in, in that bucket of activities. And then we also provide a valuable, invaluable service so far as the development application review process. We are assessing development applications from a serviceability standpoint, looking to see whether they need to upgrade uh, municipal servicing, and as well as looking at the impacts of third parties like Metrolinx or uh, utility companies in regards to the placement of their plant or impacts on municipal infrastructure. Uh, just a, 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 a bird's eye view in terms of some major accomplishments in, in 2018, it just picks up on the Auditor General's comments. So last year we delivered almost $580 million of, uh, of capital projects. Uh, uh, we reviewed over 2,000 applications. I gotta go through the rest of, of that information, but you can see that there's a sizable uh, a work program within our area. Uh, this slide, I just want to go back to the Auditor General's comment and the fact that we have two manuals that are updated on a regular basis. These are the manuals of practice, if you will, that govern the, um, the uh, contract administration for construction contracts. The Field Services Manual is a manual for our field inspectors and it's, um, and it's, and it's applied not only in terms of the field, uh, so in-house inspection staff, but also for our uh, engineering uh, consultants that we do hire. Uh, we also have a capital works procedures manual which basically guides and governs uh, the work of the project managers in terms of how they're managing uh, both co uh, construction contracts as well as professional services. So just to, to note as the Auditor General, we think that you know, these have evolved over time and we continue to update them and to improve on areas where there might be some, uh, some weaknesses. And so you know, from that standpoint, we think that they're, they're good manuals of practice. Um, I, I want to highlight a couple of points here is that the review was done on contracts that were completed in 2013 and 2017 and just going back to my comment in respect to the manuals those manuals have since been been uh, have been updated since 2013 uh, there was a major change in 2016 and 2017 so and uh, given uh, the audit uh, this year's audit they will continue to be updated um, I want to highlight in terms of, of areas that uh, we are continuing in terms of our continuous improvement activities, both in terms of mandatory training on many areas of, of project management. Uh, we also have uh, the revisions of the manuals, and then we're currently working with legal services and our uh, purchasing materials management division to update city contract documents to ensure compliance with the new construction act. There'll probably be more information on that later in the year as we need to make sure that we are compliant for the October 1, 2019 requirements. So the audit findings. Um, first and foremost, I want to highlight the fact that you know, there is no industry standard for the value of change orders. Change orders, as the Auditor General noted, is just a part of construction contract management. Um, and they are to account variations, deviations from what was spec in terms of our construction contract requirements and to affect a change that is, um, that, that is uncovered. Um, it's a requirement then to make sure that the contract that we have with the contractor reflects the change that we've, we've uh, agreed to. And just, I don't want to repeat what the Auditor General has noted, but there's a number of situations that uh, arise that result in a change to what was originally envisioned. So uh, the Auditor General uh, provided some highlights in terms of two examples. I just want to, in terms of management response, I think it's important to note that so far as example A, the major roads contract, uh, there were errors made. The city, the, the employee is no longer with the city. I think that 
you know, that needs to be, uh, that needs to be recognized. Um, on the second uh, example, this is a situation that arose, as the Auditor General noted, uh, uh, the contractor undertook work. Uh, we have not yet uncovered the documentation to support the work that the contractor has filed a claim against the city for, and in that regards, we do have some issues. So there is a claim before us, um, and uh, we are uh, proceeding now in terms of our own internal investigation with legal services and as well as with the Auditor General. Uh, I need to emphasize that at this point, no monies have been, uh, have been expended in regards to the claim made by the uh, contractor. Uh, so in reference to the Auditor General's recommendations, I just very quickly, uh, just to the point that uh, was raised, you know, we're, we've taken the recommendations quite seriously um, as we have in, in previous audits. So first and foremost, we're enhancing staff training and strengthening the performance planners that we have, particularly for our non-union staff, which is the bulk of our project managers and engineering staff, to capture compliance with stated procedures and, and protocols. Uh, secondly, we're improving our records management protocols. We have a system called the Project Tracking Portal, which is basically our database that, uh, that we use to, to manage our construction, con construction as well as our professional services contracts. And that there's a number of recommendations made in the audit that uh, will require some amendments and changes to our, uh, our system, but uh, can e be easily accommodated. Uh, next is uh, in collaboration with legal services, we're instituting a cost recovery mechanism for design errors and omissions by our professional services consultants. I need to sort of segue a little bit that if there is an error, for example, if there it has been an underestimation of a quantity, for example, it's not a question that the, that the quantity wasn't necessary. It was just, it's an underestimation. When it's all said and done, when we're in negotiations with a contractor, we'll have to pay for the extra work. The question then is, is there a premium associated with that extra work now versus if it had been bid competitively? And therein lies the problem in terms of trying to assign uh, culpability or, or cost against the consultant. So again, it's something that we will work out with legal services and we'll have to deal with this in, in terms of uh, the sort of situations that often arise. Uh, the next is uh, another key point that we we're working on, and this is advancing the professional services performance evaluation tool, quite a mouthful. We're working with PMMD and legal services. Many of you are familiar with the contractors that we have suspended um, and the application of the contractor performance evaluation. In concept, this is very much the same. ECS has piloted the approach over the last year and a half, and we are already working with legal and PMMD to actually fully implement later this year. And then lastly, um, I'd like to institute an internal project audit framework, and this is independently uh, uh, within my organization is to actually essentially duplicate what the Auditor General and her staff have done, but uh, to undertake that as part of our uh, uh, best practice within my division. And uh, so thanks for your attention. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff? Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, my apologies to staff for holding them this uh, long. I'm sure the deputy city manager will give you Tuesday off. So, <laughs> uh, okay, great. I wish. Yes. Well, there's a couple of us here that need to say sorry. Um, no. Um, but w one of the things that uh, stood out to me in the uh, in the report. Yes, so I've read the I've read the recommendations. The re report was very good, very clear, and as the uh, as actually the Auditor General said in in wrapping up her presentation, I think uh, uh, ECS has done a great a great job in the past uh, with other audit recommendations. So I have full confidence that they will on this one. But looking at the recommendations, one of the one of the first things on the executive summary is uh, number one, what we found, staff did not always adhere to these guidelines. Um, we can put as, you know, reinforce guidelines, rules, and best practices as much as we can, but if the staff aren't following them, I think there is a huge disconnect there. Um, so how do we ensure that that is ingrained uh, 
to be following these guidelines and hold, hold that to account? It's a very good, uh, through the chair, it's a very good question. I think just to sort of set a bit of context, so we have a system where we've delegated authority to our staff. So when there's a change that occurs in the field, our project engineers or managers have authority to authorize a change in the up to $10,000. Uh, the manager that the individual reports to has authority for a change up to $25,000. Uh, 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 sorry, the senior engineer does. Uh, the manager up to $50,000. And then between fifty dollars and $100,000, it's at the director level. Anything greater than that is at my authority. With each of these changes, as noted by the Auditor General, there is a requirement to justify that change. And the rationale, both in terms of the nature of the change and the costs associated with the change. And that's the expectation. It's, it's embedded within our, our procedures manual. So clearly, you know, when staff have overstepped their bounds, there need to be some consequences. So as you saw in one of my slides, what we are looking to do is to actually embed those requirements within the annual performance planners. So having an independent audit of project files, we have an ability then to, to connect up the compliance with the uh, uh, their compensation at year end. So that's, that's and, and as well as I need to emphasize, you can never do in our business enough training and enforcement of, and so we'll continue to do that mandatory training for our project management staff. Right, um, so I'm moving to page four of uh, the actual report. Um, so one of the notes here is significant delays by consultants in submitting change orders. Um, and these uh, consultants are, are outside of the city. We bring them in as a third party. It seems to me that uh, it, it never fails to have, we have challenges uh, with outside consultants, uh, outside contractors or whenever it is. Um, how do we hold them to account and uh, make sure that we are getting the best value uh, for, for the money we're spending? Through, through, the, uh, through the chair, uh, again, one of the recommendations is that it, in a fulsome way we'll be implementing our professional services performance evaluation tool. So far as the consultants are concerned, you know, there are often times when they are still trying to navigate through and trying to understand and, and back and forth with the contractor with respect to the justification of the change and the cost associated with that change. So sometimes that's period of negotiations of back and forth. I think the Auditor General has, has noted that. What we haven't done a very good job is the record keeping of the changes that occur in the, in the negotiations. Mm. But further to that, I need to emphasize, I mentioned in one of the slides that the Construction Act requirements that come into effect October 1st of this year, and that's going to impose some pretty stringent requirements on us as staff as well as our consultants. Uh, there's a prompt payment provision which basically obligates us to pay the contractor within 28 days of receiving a proper invoice. So that's further going to tighten the requirements on us to make sure that we've approved the invoice and or if we're dealing with a change that that happens in a timely manner as well. Okay. Um, I guess my, my, my last question is, um, you know, you're, it's not really on the audit but more of a general uh, question is uh, there's been a number of movements within ECS in terms of audits and whatnot, uh, some disciplinary actions happening. You once again have to make a decision to uh, uh, terminate employment on an individual, if I saw. Um, through, through the chair, uh, if we want to delve into that item, I'd submit that we probably have to go in. No, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't want to do that. Um, Okay, you know what, I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ford. Councillor Fillion. Uh, it's a question around the flip side of the guideline coin and just a, a quick anecdote. It was actually another division, but earlier this year, work was going to be done on a major road. It was going to take three months. And um, I said, well, no, it, can't take three months, so come back with a different solution. So they came back with something that would take three to four weeks. I said, is it going to cost more? And they said, no, it's actually going to cost a million dollars less. I said, is there going to be less work done? And they said, no, 
there's going to be more work done. And I said, like, so how is this possible? And the reason the staff were going to spend three months for an extra million dollars to do less work was following a guideline. So I guess my question is in our, you know, um, in our efforts to, you know, bring some order to things and everybody can kind of cover themselves by following a guideline, how do we make sure we don't start just stupidly following guidelines? Uh, through, through the chair, maybe just a couple of comments. One is that, and again, I come back to our Capital Works Procedures Manual, which, which guides the project management activities. As well, there's an awful lot of work that goes into the planning of projects, particularly when they are quite disruptive. Um, and so what we've opted to do there is to look at ways of minimizing the impact and sometimes when it's all said and done, using extended hours and into the evening hours, what we have found is that it benefits the contractor because they're not having to set up traffic controls, uh, set them up and then remove them and then reinstate the following day so that if we can extend their work schedule for the day, there's greater productivity for them in a given day. Not in all cases, but on a case-by-case -case basis, that's the kind of thing that we look at. No, no, what I meant was that the, and I do, that was an extreme example, but I do run into this all the time, that staff are proposing something and you say, but that makes no sense, and they say, well, we're following the guideline. And it's very hard to move anybody off the guideline because they don't want to end up in a audit report or something that they didn't follow the guideline. If you follow the guideline, you're safe. As soon as you move yourself off the guideline, you're exposing yourself, but in probably a very small percentage of cases, the smart thing to do is to not follow the guidelines. So how do we ensure that our staff don't just become guideline followers and lose their thinking ability? Well, through, through the chair, my comment there is that we're holding staff to account. If I go back to the two manuals that we have, that's the expectation. If there's, a, uh, if, if there's an ability to vary how we actually stage or undertake the work, that's a completely different situation. And in that particular case of a counselor or there's, there's a, a suggestion been made then, uh, and that the frontline project manager is uncomfortable with that. We do have an escalation protocol. Ultimately, it's up at my level in terms of a final decision. But I need to emphasize that we are holding staff to account. That's their objective. You know, there's, there's obligations that they themselves have in, ter in terms of taking care of their responsibilities and managing these projects. And that's, I think, at the root of what the, uh, the Auditor General found. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nunziata. I just have one question because it's Friday for a long weekend and I really actually had a, a lot of questions but just one question because I noticed this in in the report um, do you to ensure that future bridge project tenders are based on recent condition assessments so I think you know what my question is going to be Scarlet Road Bridge that we started working on it 20 years ago and we haven't even started yet and we've done designs, engineer designs, we've had meetings and we still haven't started the project. So the cost of that though, that's escalated drastically in 20 years. This is at Scarlet and St. Clair. Through, through the chair, I, I guess the, the example or the project that was the, the focus of the audit in this report is in regards to quantity estimates on a bridge rehabilitation. Um, that were dated for a number of different reasons, uh, but I think the recommendation is, and it's a valid one, is that what we need to do is to make sure that when we do quantity estimates for bridge rehabilitation is that they are as current as they can be, recognizing that these are extremely complex projects so that there's an awful lot of lead time to complete the design work. And the point there is, is that when it comes to bridge rehabilitation, I mean, these structures do deteriorate. There's, there's more cover concrete that can spall over the time that the last inspection was a detailed inspections. And I think that's at the root of it, and it's a, and it's a good uh, best management price. Make sure that those surveys, those detailed assessments are as current as they can be. So the cost, the cost for the St. Clair, St. Clair and, St. Uh, and Scarlet Bridge probably escalated double because we started it 20 years ago. 
uh, through the chair uh, could very well have, but I think the circumstances on that particular complex project, it was more of a project planning issue than it has been in terms of us uh, undertaking to rebuild that structure. So, and again, there's, as you full know, there's an awful lot of history on that project. We need to start it now. Thank you, Councillor. All right, uh, are there any other further questions? Seeing none, any members wishing to speak on the item? Councillor Ford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very brief, uh, I will move staff recommendations and um, and I think uh, uh, just uh, in what the Honourable General said, I think I sent in my questions, but I think I'm up most faith in Mr. DeAndre's department to uh, kind of get on top of this stuff and move it forward. And uh, if any of our roads don't get resurfaced this year, I know why, because we've kept them a little late. <laughs> All right, um, Councillor Fillion. Yeah, just really briefly, it's, uh, it was nice to see a report where the Auditor General says, you know, we're, we're doing pretty good and where the staff says, you know, do even better and, it doesn't, there, there are no headlines, there's no, right. uh, you know, things are working as they should, so that's great. Fantastic. Um, that said, on the item, all those in favor? Any opposed, that is carried. That was our yeah. last. May I, may I uh, uh, just as part no, of the sir, conclusion Matt. of our meeting, uh, my two favorite quotes of the day uh, that can only be made at audit committee, one is, it takes a village uh, to raise a child and it takes a village to write a report. Fantastic. And then the other one was accountants trying to be cutting edge. <laughs> you don't hear that every day, but it's awesome. Anyway, thank you. I hear it every day. With that, happy Canada Day, day everybody. <laughs> Meetings adjourned. <laughs>